Hey everybody, it's Matt Weaver with Bible Proof, uh, <laughs> Proof Truth Project.com. And uh, I am here with Dr. Christian Widener, and we're going to discuss a, a book that he wrote about the last days. And um, this is a really interesting read. It's a very, uh, it's a good and technical read. He's, he's thorough with it. So I enjoyed reading it and I look forward to talking about it. So thank you for doing this, uh, Dr. Widener. Yeah, no, my pleasure, man. So tell me a little bit um, about why you wrote this book. Um, so it, it came out of the, the research that I'd done at Temple. And so if people saw my early interview with you on the Temple Revealed, mm -hmm. the true location of the Jewish Temple hidden in plain sight, um, it was, you know, because that seemed to me to be a big prophetic marker of the last days. And, you know, could it be rebuilt? And what are the obstacles? Um, but in doing that, there were some other sort of, you know, historic facts that it emerged from that research that I thought were lining up with Bible prophecy um, in an intriguing way. Um, but, but it was still, I was still in a kind of a watch and wait mode. And I thought that the most important piece that needed to, to go out first was the, about the temple. Um, but there was always been in my heart to write a prophecy book. I just didn't feel like the Lord was saying, I always felt like when I started to try to take steps to, to do something with that, um, that it was a not yet and a not yet. But um, in 2020, um, really 2021, 2020 things started changing and I got some final pieces. Um, and then 2021, I felt the spirit saying, all right, now's the time. So I, I actually had a, the second book was supposed to be called Finding Solomon, which is sort of continuing this biblical archaeology theme. Yep. Um, but I felt like I had to do a detour and, and do this book first um, because of the timeliness of what was going on and how it was lining up with Bible prophecy. And this is something that we had discussed this, I think, last time it was off off camera. But this is something you've been studying prophecy. I mean, this is a big hobby of yours as well, um, is studying prophecy, yeah. et cetera. So even though you had interest in the temple, that was kind of a piece um, of the greater picture of what you've been studying for the last, I don't know, several decades. Yeah, that's, that's true. In fact, um, it was, it was studying prophecy that actually was a big part in me. I mean, I've always gone to, to church. I grew up in a Christian home that studied the Bible. So like studying the Bible has been something that I've been doing since, you know, I was a teenager in, in terms of, you know, on my own and, and in a deep sort of personal way that, um, that not, not everybody um, gets to that point that early, but um, but it was because my parents did it. That was something that then passed to me. Um, and in doing that, I had you know kind of just done like a lot of people. Um, you you live your Christian life, but then you start you know getting in caught up in in what life's you know going on. And and I really kind of let prophecy go, but. Um, in the mid 2000s started getting back into studying prophecy again. And that really sort of reawakened and reinvigorated my, my own walk. Um, and in a way that brings the scriptures alive because to study prophecy is to study really a third of the Bible. You can't, you know, just study one or two passages and go, okay, I've got prophecy down. It's really, it's a, it's a new lens to sort of understand, uh, the scriptures beyond just theology and, um, the basics of uh, salvation. It's, it's really our blessed hope. How is this all going to, how is this madness that's around us? How is the sin of the world? How are all these things that we, we face? What, what is that really leading us to? Um, and is it just sort of this endless slog through history or no, 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 just like Christ came physically to earth uh, once upon a time and, um, you know, made an atonement for sin. He's also going to, come back again and restore things as they were meant to be. Amen. And this book is entitled Witness in the End. I don't have the physical book. Um, you were gracious enough to send oh, me a PDF I can hold that spring. up here. Might as well do that so people can yeah. see it. So here we go. This is an interesting, uh, it's an interesting read, but what's, what's I think is fascinating is you kind of saw something in 2020 um, that probably that caught your attention with, and that in your mind kind of kicked this whole thing off in your mind. Am, am I, am I right or am I wrong as far as yeah. 
the image. That's kind of what started this whole thing. And then you kind of plugged in all this information that you've been studying over the years. So tell us a little bit about that. Yep. So actually in studying the, for the temple, um, there was something that I came across that was, they just blew my mind and it's the subtitle of the book. So Daniel 77s and the final decree everyone missed. And a lot of people know that there were these four possible decrees in the ancient past, which pointed to the first coming of Christ. But, but as I was studying the restoration and, and the history of Jerusalem, I found that there had been another restoration of Jerusalem um, in, the, in the reasonably modern times in the 1500s. And I just said, well, what, what do you mean? It was, you know, it was rebuilt again and it was restored and like, hmm, it was done by a sultan that would have had to have been done by decree. There must be another decree. Um, and so that just kind of gnawed at me. And uh, the timing for that was also really suspect because there was this window of a possible decree in, in the time period between 1535 and 1538. And so if, if you kind of did the, the math, um, it just sort of suggested a possibility that there would be really the big reveal in the book is that there could be a second period of 77s. Um, but it was just kind of a theory. It was just an idea. Hmm. You know, the timing is, is interesting. Um, and depending on how you count and exactly what year it was, there was some kind of window between really 2014, uh, 20, 2012, really to 2020, something like that, um, where you started getting like, okay, it, it couldn't be, if this is really true, there's something's the world's going to change in that period of time. Um, but it, but it didn't, everything just kept cruising along. So I'm like, Hmm, this seems really compelling. And I, I could never find exactly the decree or the date or anything like that. So I didn't have really firm evidence. I just had this hunch. Um, but in 2020, the world did change and we got a coronavirus pandemic. And, um, that was interesting also, we started losing our freedoms and, and people, the entire world responded in, in the exact same way. And I started thinking, you know, that kind of sounds like something that could be, uh, you know, could match what we were told to expect from the white horse. And, you know, and I could see how that could lead to major disruptions in the world because you can't just shut down the world economy and think there's not going to be a, a, you know, an impact from that. Um, and so I started going to look again for where could this, you know, where could the, a decree be found, you know, and um, some of those promptings, I think really we have to credit the Holy Spirit with just how did you get that idea? I don't know. I just, I felt like I should go look and I looked and I looked and lo and behold, I found something. I found a book that had been written by a Turkish guy called the Ottoman in in inscriptions of Jerusalem. And in it, he has pictures of all the, these stone plaques that are placed literally all over Jerusalem. And, um, and, and he translates them. And so that's what then I went, oh, whoa, wait a second. There is a decree. It's written in stone and it's got dates. And so that started um, really, that just blew my mind. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, that looking at, you know, the things in the world, plus there was one other thing, the Abraham Accords. And, and I just thought, hmm, that, that looks really interesting because if we're in that time, there should be a peace agreement. And there was an amazing historic peace agreement called the Abraham Accords. And they go, well, but that's not a seven-year treaty. And like, well, let's go back and look what the scriptures say. It says, and he will confirm or make firm a covenant or the covenant with the many for one seven. And so if it's the final week of Daniel, there's only seven years in that final week. So it doesn't have to say seven years. It just de facto will be for seven years. Um, and by calling it the Abraham Accords, it's kind of a way of, you could see it as confirming the Abrahamic covenant. And it was with many nations. Like for the first time, Israel makes a peace treaty that's not just them with one nation. It's all the nations are joining on to this one bandwagon, the Abraham Accords. Like what? That's, that doesn't happen. That's not even the way normal nations make peace agreements. It was just weird. And it kind of matched the language of scripture. So once I saw these things kind of matching what scripture is, not what we expect the scripture to mean, which is, you know, there's always a danger 
in deciding ahead of time specifically what some you know prophecy means and how it will be fulfilled. So what we need to do is kind of remember the words that we're told to watch for, right? But then be keep an open mind about what scenarios might fulfill that prophecy specifically. Um, and so anyway, as I saw that, I started seeing a whole bunch of things that were potentially converging. And so that made me dig a little further. And if you go back to the prophecy in Daniel, one of the other really amazing things that it says is, it says that, you know, from the issuing the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, Prince, two titles, um, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. And then it says it will be restored with plaza and moat, or some translations will say streets in a trench. Well, whenever you find, you know, sort of a discrepancy on a very specific thing that you're looking for, you got to go back to the Hebrew and see, wait, why do they say streets in a trench versus plaza and moat, which what's the really the right idea. And um, for the, the streets or the plaza, the word is Rehob. And Rehob means a big open area where people can meet. And so I looked for that word, a word search on where is Rehob used in the scriptures. And one of the places it's used is in Ezra, um, where um, when, the, when they, people were brought back to the land and they had taken foreign wives, they were all gathered in the Rehob of the temple. And, and they were, that's where they repented and they, but you go Rehob of the temple. Oh, that's the temple Mount. That's the plaza of the temple Mount. Um, now it can also be in the city gate, that word. So it can, it doesn't have to mean the temple Mount, but it includes the temple Mount in scripture. Right. And then uh, a moat can, is really a, it's a dugout area. It can be a trench or a fortified structure. But because the scripture says it would be restored and rebuilt, then we know it's not just a dirt trench. It's a, it's a moat. It's a defensive structure. Um, so, so then that gives us kind of like, hmm, all right, so we're looking for a plaza and moat, and how do we know this was, were restored? And um, we presume that those structures were, presume, were restored. You froze up on me. I don't know if you can hear me or not. All right. Yeah. Sorry about that. I don't know if nope. it was my end or your end. The yeah, wonders of the internet. Yeah. So anyway, it, it says that Jerusalem would be restored with plaza and moat. And, um, and what I found was that there, when I, I got this Turkish guy's book who had all these uh, decrees around Jerusalem restored, I mean, and, and translated from the restorations, um, I found, wait, there was one at the moat that's around the Citadel of David in the old city. And I'm like, what? There's a well, one that there's a moat in the old city. Not everybody knows that, but it's around yep. the Tower of David. Right. Um, and it's an amazing structure. And, and some people might wonder if that moat is really ancient or not. And one of the important things to know about that is also the stones, the lower stones of that have a margin and they're very large ashlar stones, just like the Western wall stones. So that's how you know that this moat goes all the way back to temple times, not just, you know, a modern, you know, creation of one of the other, uh, maybe in the time of the crusaders or something like that. It's, it's older than that. So it goes back to the temple and it was restored and it has a plaque that says this was decreed to be restored. And then the temple Mount Plaza, um, it was restored by Sultan Suleiman also. And he placed, when he did that, he placed a, a fountain at the Northern end. And it has this plaque that says, this was de decreed to be restored um, by Sultan Su Suleiman. Amazingly, it faces the area of the temple. Um, and it has the date, the beginning of Shaban 943, which um, in our calendar is uh, January, the, between the 13th and 23rd of January, 1537. And I went, whoa, 1537, there's the decree and it's written in stone and it's there today for everybody to see and nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. um, and 483 years from 1537 for people who are good at math is the year 2020. So if that was really a, a decreeing a second period of 77s, then there would have to be something amazing happen in the year 2020. 
and something did amazing happen, right? The world started shutting down. It was like a huge tsunami for everybody. Nobody missed, you know, the pandemic. Um, it was right. something that really captured the entire world. The entire world responded in a similar way, which was also amazing. I mean, think about radical Islamic dictatorships, communist countries, you know, North Korea responded the same as America and Australia. I mean, what? Like, that was so bizarre. Um, but it's what you would expect if something global had just started to shift and change. Um, and so when I looked at, you know, all right, there is, there was a second decree. Um, the very structures that are mentioned in scripture have stone plaques. I just said, this has got to be something important. This is something for people to, to think about and know. And it made me also then start going back and really studying the first coming of Christ and those decrees and how they line up with Bible prophecy. And that kind of led me to some really neat discoveries too, because um, most people today would say that it was the fourth decree uh, of, the po of the four possible ones, the second decree of Artaxerxes in 444 BC. And they would be um, very familiar maybe with a, um, a, a chronology that was put together by Harold Honer, who was building on the work of um, uh, Sir Anderson. Um, I forget, um, his name's flying out of my brain, but, um, but it's, it was the idea that the 444 BC and you should count with years of 360 days, not 365. And, you know, I thought that was a really interesting theory when I first heard it It seemed to line up and I didn't have any problems with it, except it was kind of weird that um, people were counting with a 360 day year, not a 365 day year. Um, but, you know, there was some just prophetic, I mean, you know, or some biblical justification for it. And, you know, without a better argument. OK, fine. Um, but it also had this one other nagging idea that was it was 69 weeks precisely to the day and then god just stopped counting and he's stopped counting for 2000 years until the final week and then he's going to hit the stop watch again at a time that nobody knows and you go okay but that means it's not really 70 weeks it's 350 you know two plus weeks you know counting on to whenever the lord's return is and they go yeah but that's not really like for me as an engineer that's not really a satisfying answer. Um, and so I started thinking, well, so clearly the prophecy is not fulfilled because 77s are decreed to atone for sin, um, to uh, take care of iniquity and um, to end transgression, something like that. And I'm, your readers can, or listeners can, can go and uh, look that up because I'm not quoting it perfectly. Um, but it's three things to do with the atoning of sin. The last three, though, are to bring in uh, everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And people have tried to argue that those were also completed in the past, but, but it's, they're very thin. That's, that's thin ice. Um, the first three are easy for the cross to have atoned for. Um, but the last three, I don't know about bringing in everlasting righteousness. This doesn't feel like everlasting righteousness to me, um, much less um, you know, sealing up vision and prophecy um, how do we know prophecy wasn't sealed up in the ancient past? Well, how about Israel becoming a nation again, right? That's a huge modern fulfillment of prophecy in our day. So clearly prophecy wasn't done in 70 AD. And so, you know, you, you see that mm, now there is this period of time that's left, but could we have had 77s in the past? So I started digging into that and looking at, well, the third decree was 458 BC. And 458 BC to 33 AD, which is the, the best year, the most historically attested um, date for the crucifixion. People have argued anywhere between maybe 29 to 33 AD, even 34 AD, some people have tried to argue. Um, but 33 AD is the best, uh, I think. And in the book, I kind of explain and go through, through that a little bit. Um, but 33 AD to 458, that's exactly 490 years. And I'm like, well, what? It's exactly 490 years from 458. You, you lose one year when you cross the, the date line from BC to AD. So it's 457 plus 33 years, 490. Boom. That sounds like, well, but then, 
but then you think about that and you go, well, but then that means Christ started his ministry in 26 or 27 AD. Um, and really 27 AD um, is the best sort of date for that. And you go, yeah, there's awesome uh, support for 27 AD as the start of Christ's ministry. But then you go, well, but then that means his ministry was six to seven years. Nobody says that. Um, so how do we know that Christ's ministry was three years? People have argued one to three years. Um, if you go back in time and you look at the early church, so, you know, hundreds of years before um, Constantine or 150 years, maybe to 100 years before that, um, you have Irenaeus arguing that Christ's ministry must have been 10 years. So what does that tell us? What it tells us is nobody knows how long Christ's ministry really was. It wasn't an important thing that was recorded um, in the Gospels, and it wasn't known by the early church. They just, you know, that was one of the details that kind of slipped away that nobody thought to ask um, and then pass on. So, um, so there's, there's no scriptural or any reason. In fact, um, we know from one of the Gospels that if everything that Jesus said it did was written down, not all the books in the world could contain it, um, which is, you know, also a, you know, a use of hyperbole, but clearly communicating the idea that Jesus did tons of things that there, that weren't recorded. So a longer ministry is not really that hard to accept. Um, if you look at the best dates that we have from based on um, Luke is the one who gives us the start of uh, John's ministry. So then you go, all right, we have reasons for these dates and you see this perfect 490 years in the first coming. Clearly the prophecy is not complete. So could we have basically a period of 77s for his first coming and a period of 77s for his second coming? And, um, and I think if people take a look at that, that's chapter five in the book, they'll see a really strong argument to say that this could be right now the final week of Daniel. Which, which in itself is like an astounding, uh, an astounding thought. I mean, for so many years, people, uh, I guess, looked at prophecy and then, you, you know, you have the, the eighties where um, you had a lot of different types of prophecy kind of cycling around, whether it be how Lindsay and some of those guys, mm -hmm. you know, and then you have kind of the left behind series kind of thing, in the nineties and imminence yeah. really took over. And, and then all of a sudden people kind of, maybe revolted a bit against prophecy he said well nobody really knows and yeah back away from it a little bit and just kind of yep. let it let it go and that's and that's kind of where we're at now um kind of and there's obviously people that are always, always going to be interested in prophecy but it's interesting to me like in the parable of the virgins for instance mm -hmm. that half of them do fall asleep you know, right well which, even all of them fall asleep actually actually you're you're right <laughs> yep yep but, they all fall know, asleep but there's this kind of they kind of get tired of it. They get tired mm -hmm. of staying awake. They get tired of being alert. They just kind of say, it's not going to happen. Right. And yep. that's a little bit of what goes on the, in the parable because the whole, the whole concept behind the parable is the, is the marriage. And, yep. and the whole point of the, the virgins being out is, is to alert the bride that the, the groom has come. So they're out there with lights and they're supposed to like have enough light to go through the night to make sure that, you know, when the groom comes that they're ready. So mm -hmm. this whole, this whole theme is not too hard to understand, but I, but I look at this and it's hard for me to like, in, in one sense of me, this is just my reaction to it. It's like, really, could we actually be in the time frame? And the other side of me is like, well, how many people have, you know, proposed dates and stuff before and it's failed. And then I go back right. to, but we have never seen the conditions that we see today historically. Right. So yeah. all of these things kind of coming together, it's a very interesting thing. And I think the interest, the thing that you're putting forth more than anything else is, is the whole, and, and that's, again, I agree with you. It doesn't quite make sense to me the way a lot of people have interpreted the 70 weeks, right? So you have the 69 mm -hmm. and the final seven that, that is, even though I understand the logic behind it, it really seems like a twisting of scripture to me to, to, to really make it work, even though, okay. I mean, there's arguments for it. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't flow naturally, right? It's a little bit of a forcing uh, going on, but 
whatever. But in this case, it's a little bit different. You know, you have this, this, you know, near fulfillment in his first coming and this and his, you know, future fulfillment, which what we, what we could be seeing right now um, taking place with this view that from the decree going forth um, from Solomon the Magnificent. So that is, you know, it's, it's very interesting stuff. Now, have you, has anybody else ever talked about this, the decree, the plaza moat, this kind of a view, or are you one of the only ones that you know of? Yeah, this, um, there are a few people who, if you look on the internet and you start searching, you'll find a few people in it, And I actually include them in the book and the notes in the back that, that said, Hey, wait a sec. Could there be, look at this. It was rebuilt again. Could there be a decree? Um, but as far as I know, nobody has found like this book, you know, that has the, the translations and then is gone. Wait a sec, plaza and moat here, here it is fitting Daniel, you know, verbatim for what we're told to expect. And all these things are happening. Nobody's put this together and that it's, you know, some engineer from, you know, South Dakota, um, who's, who's pulled this out, who, you know, isn't known in the prophecy circles and things like that. It's extremely unlikely. Um, so, so I, you know, I look at myself and I go, you know, why, who's going to believe this? Um, but I'm a researcher. I'm used to working on things that nobody knows. Like, in fact, actually as a researcher, if you're working on things that people already know, you're not a researcher. True. I mean, you, you, yeah. by definition, I have to be doing stuff. So in my professional career, um, I worked in advanced metallurgy processes and joining, um, processes. And I was only doing things that no one else had ever done before that that's because otherwise, again, you're not going to get funded to do the things that people already know. Um, so I took a lot of that and I just take that and put it into prophecy. So when the things I'm saying in here, a lot of times people go, well, yeah, but I've not heard anybody else say that. I'm like, yes. And I wouldn't have written the book if it was already out there. I would not, I would just would have learned it for myself. And that was, I'd be done. But when I realized I was learning these things that nobody knew and, and they were easy to document and prove and lay out, like there's over 400 footnotes in the book to give people every little piece of information that I think builds the case. Yep. Here's exactly where it came from. Um, and when I realized that that wasn't out there, I just, you know, I felt a burden and I asked the Lord like, Hey, look, God, am I supposed to do something about this? And, and I, like I said, I, I felt this note, but not yet. No, nope, but not yet. And then all of a sudden, yeah, go. And mm -hmm. so I'm trying to be faithful to the things that, that I feel like God is leading me to do. Um, I can't claim any special revelation, but I, I definitely feel like um, th that I'm supposed to be, you know, sharing what I'm sharing. I know these things are facts and that they're real. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm totally confident in, in the information that I'm presenting does it mean that we're at the end? Yeah, I think so. And, and, and there's, there's other cases I make. So another thing that I do in the book um, is Jesus makes this principle and it comes from the book of Deuteronomy, but he says, you know, a matter must be established by two or more witnesses. And I think in scripture and theology and the things that we believe, um, the important things are always established by multiple witnesses within scripture. So I wanted to look for some other indicators, right? Other independent ways that, that this might be converging, um, show that we're converging on, on the end. And I found uh, three actually really big ones. One on uh, the, uh, the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree for a, a generation and um, the age of the earth and a jubilee. So, so those were other things that, that I started saying, hey, wait a sec. There's some, and we can, we can get into those later, but um, it's just, you're, you're looking at what's going on and, and I'm always trying to talk myself out of, could this be the time? How do you know what you think you're seeing is true and real? And I think people will, if they give it a chance, they'll find that I don't, I'm not putting anything in there that, that I don't have a, they don't have some kind of backup for. Yeah. And I agree with that. You were very thorough. Uh, you were very thorough with it. And I mean, you present a very compelling case. It's a very unique case. Again, like you said, nobody else talked about it. I've never heard anything quite like that before. So, you know, and I think this is maybe part of, 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 
you know, even Daniel says that some of this information will be hidden until the time of the end, right? And so all of a sudden it will make sense to us in our time frame. And I've always hesitated with prophecy when people have just flung theories out there of, you know, Russia invades Ukraine, just as an example. Um, mm -hmm. This must be the last days or World War II came around. This is Gog and Magog, you know? Right. Well, you have to match what the Bible describes, I think, fairly uh, convincingly. And a lot of times with prophecy, it, there are these very vague connections. Um, and in this mm -hmm. case, it's something in stone. You know, you have a decree in stone and the time frame from that moment to 2020. That's interesting. You know, I'm not a sensationalist. Ask the people around me. I don't mm -hmm. get caught up in a lot of, I'm normally a naysayer and normally somebody like, nah, no, 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 eh, right. that makes, that's me. But to like, to see that it was like, Hmm, you at least maybe do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, me, me too. I mean, it, it, I was just like, this can't be real and it's totally real. Hmm. So, and, and, I was just in Israel a couple of months ago. I uh, was able to take my family over, which is really, really good time. But, you know, oh, I've awesome. walked, I would walk around that area. You know, of course I didn't read the book at that time. It's part of why I was busy this summer because I, Oh no, I, I was <laughs> yeah. gone for a couple of weeks and then I come back and, you know, when you're gone from work, it just kind of hits you. Yeah. So <laughs> the summer has flown by, but it was, um, you know, I'm just seeing this picture as you were describing it, you know, I mean, I was just there and, Look at how the nations were totally affected by COVID. Even when we were there, we we left for Israel the day that the mandates went away. So the, the night before they made the ruling on the masks. Okay. Oh yeah. So the next day we were able to fly mask free, which, you know, talking about the effects that COVID had on the nations, you know, that was mm -hmm. something that was very real. I mean, just little things like that. We still have, you know vaccine things and stuff like that yeah. that are in place. But at the end of the day, how this has gripped the nations and it has seemingly opened the door. Uh, I hate to use the word, the word new world order, but I think the political mechanisms out there are certainly trying to, to steer it that way. Yeah. Um, the stuff that we see today is, you know, the, the global elite clearly are wanting to take advantage of the crisis and leverage it Mm -hmm. all that they can, whether it be on issues of energy, on the issues of agriculture, issues of production. Yeah. They want to see this as a, as a, as a, a way to just undermine existing industries and reinvent the wheel, if you will. So, you know, this all started in 2020. Now I don't know, is this the last days play out or not, but you build a very, very compelling case that we could be seeing it. So if that's the case in your mind, what do you see as some of these signs? And I know you cover this in the book, but what are some of the signs mm -hmm. that we should be seeing if we're in this sequence? Right. Yeah. So, so we talked about a, a white horse, um, but there's, there's a big presumption about the timing of the seals and in relationship to the final week of Daniel. And there is nothing that really tells us for certain that the seven years will begin with one of the first seals. Um, but it's, but it's an inference and I think it's pretty strong, right? So, so you, you could, you don't have to, I think, have a first seal open, but it, but it seems like you do. And when you look, you have this, the, the first seal, it says, um, there's a rider on a white horse and he has a crown and he has a bow and he goes out conquering and to conquer. And you go, okay, so he has a, a crown. Um, well, the, the word for crown in Latin is Corona. So, you know, you go, wait a sec. You mean this whole pandemic started with a crown virus? Like that's weird. Um, and a bow represents a, uh, airborne threat that travels a long distance. So sort of an airborne virus going around the globe is not really inconsistent with, with that, with that image. And he goes out conquering and to conquer but not through violence because the second horse is a red horse and its rider is given a great sword and he's given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay one another. 
So we think of that as war, but it's really war and just, you know, an increase in violence um, and mayhem. And if that's the case, then the first horse can't be conquering by violence. He has to be conquering by, you know, political means and deception. And um, as I was looking at the coronavirus pandemic as an engineer, um, it just, you know, I could do the numbers and I could do the math and the projections. And I just started realizing, wait a sec, this is, this is not, you know, this is not rational. Um, masks aren't rational um, from a, I mean, you know, depending, a lot of people have different views, but I used to have to wear masks for work. I know exactly what masks can stop and what they can't stop. Um, we worked with fine metal powders in the micron size range. Yes, they work great. Even N95 masks. But you start talking about airborne aerosols and things like that at the nanoscale. Nope, nothing stops that. Um, and, and people know it intrinsically. If you told them like, hey, we're going to put you in an Ebola ward with Ebola all around you. And all you have to do is put on this little mask and you'll be fine. Everybody knows, no way, that's not going to stop it. Right? You're going to get Ebola. Um, but somehow people believe that if you just put on this little, you know, mask, it was going to magically stop the virus, especially if, you know, you took it off only when you ate or, you know, all these other little bizarre things that just like, no, you can't, this virus is going to go everywhere. Everybody has to face it. You just, you know, put yourself in the hands of God, pray and, and, you know, we'll do this. We'll face it just like we do every other little, you know, virus or flu or other thing, but that's not the way the world responded. So, and in that, freedoms were taken away. People couldn't go to church, right? They were told not to sing. You could do any other thing, but you couldn't, you know, it was clearly spiritual. Um, there was this massive spiritual battle um, going on. And you could see how suddenly we could lose um, a lot of the freedoms that we took for granted. Yeah. Um, so I said, that's a conquering and going out to conquer. That, that fits. But if that's true, then you'd have to have war and violence and mayhem. And what happened in 2020? A sudden spike in violence, in suicide, in murder, um, in uh, armed conflicts between nations, in civil war, in protests, um, and you had the Ukraine inv invasion of Ukraine, which I think has, um, I think history will show that that was the start of World War III. Now, some people say yes, some people say no. Yes, the jury's still out. Um, but um, as I was thinking about that, I looked back at the history of World War II and Germany invaded Poland, but it wasn't until eight months later that they actually launched their full um, larger campaign that started attacking the rest of Europe. So, it, it would, you know, it didn't, none of these things, you know, materialized immediately. Um, it takes time. So, so I look around and I see, well, we're, we're good on so many ways to say we have a red horse that's riding and it's going to get worse. Um, but I said, well, that, what's the next horse? The next horse is a black horse. And he holds scales in his hands and he says three quarts of, uh, of uh, a denarius, or a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine, which, which implies an inflation and a massive increase in the cost of food um, and ultimately famine um, and scarcity. But for the lower, you know, portion of, of society for the poorer people, because the people crying out, do not damage oil and the wine are probably the rich. And so, um, are we, you know, seeing inflation? If you look back in history, normally inflation was something that was, um, a country by country thing. A particular country made some bad financial decisions. They, in, you know, Zimbabwe gets in this terrible inflationary spiral, um, and they, they fall apart. Um, Germany post World War I um, um, also got into this inflationary spiral that really opened up the door for, for um, World War II. But right now, the inflation that we're experiencing is totally global. Every nation in the earth is experiencing inflation at varying degrees, and some of it terrible. Um, and every sign that's continued to get worse. And with the invasion of Ukraine and Russia, you know, starting to be in a negative posture to the rest of the world, you have a quarter of the world's food supply at risk for not going to where it used to go. In fact, I think half the feed, the poorer food comes from Ukraine. Hmm. So you could see we're already <coughs> seeing food shortages 
Um, we're already seeing empty shelves. I mean, baby formula, you know, things that these little, they're canaries in the coal mine. They're not, you know, full famine yet. Um, but you're already seeing a, a massive reduction of the available food. You're seeing a massive disruption of supply lines to distribute the food that there is. Um, you're seeing inflation. We're seeing tons of evidence for a black horse. And again, not in one country. It's not just an American thing. It's a global thing. Um, and then that would have to bring a fourth horse, which is a pale horse that brings death with him. Um, and you go, well, is there any evidence for that? Well, clearly that it says that, um, first of all, it, the black horse, or, or I mean, a pale horse comes and his rider is named death. And it says they were given power or over a quarter of the earth to kill by the combined plagues, war, famine, pestilence, and the wild beasts of the earth. So that, that a quarter of the earth at this point would be almost 2 billion people. So, you know, we're not anywhere close to that. We haven't seen, we haven't seen that yet. Um, but what, what, what we know from that is it's they, it's the four horsemen, it's war, famine, and pestilence. It's the things that started with the first horseman um, that all combine and finally lead to a massive death. And so are we seeing any signs of that? Well, um, coronavirus, you know, supposedly killed about 6 million people globally over the last two years. And that's a big number, but it's, it's only a little bit more than pneumonia and flu actually normally used to kill. So, you know, that, that's been, there's been a lot of hype in those numbers, but compared to other numbers, they're, they're not, it, it definitely didn't justify all the lockdowns that we did. Um, but if you look at excess deaths, that means deaths from all causes around the globe. All of a sudden in 2020, there was this spike. There's this, we're on this hockey stick curve right now for, for excess deaths globally. Unexplained, could be heart disease, could be you know, suicide, it can be car accidents, it could be anything. But suddenly in the last two years, 20 to 25 million more people have died than what they expected. And the reason why that's significant is we have almost 8 billion people on the planet right now. So they really know, they can predict really, really well how many people are going to die by, any, uh, by all causes, because it's just an average. Um, and anybody who understands statistics, the more samples you have, the, the closer your predictions are to the, to the true numbers and the true averages for the population. So when all of a sudden we started seeing the spike and you go, wow, 20. 25 million extra people have died in the last two years. That's significant. That's a lot. That's almost like a, a silent, you know, World War II that's been happening that nobody's, you know, because it's, it's all these reasons, you know, various reasons. Um, and what's, I'm sure, you know, you've heard of this, but where did sudden adult death syndrome come from? Like what? All of a sudden we have a new name um, sudden adult death syndrome and nobody's thinking, Hey, this couldn't have anything to do with the virus, the pandemic or the vaccines. Like it's, it's totally related. Um, it's just a question of proving how and, and where and, and what methods, but this time has changed the death rate. And so, um, and there's, uh, if you look at the famine and the things that are likely to come still yet, People are saying there's a billion people that are at risk for, for food supply in the next two years. So yeah, if there's a billion people at risk now, then we are on a path. Um, there are also, you know, people have wondered, will Putin use nuclear weapons, right? Could we get into a limited tactical nuke battle as part of World War III? Yes, that's on the table. Doesn't mean it'll happen, right? It just, it's, a lot of experts who aren't looking at prophecy, they don't, you know, they would never agree with me that this is the final week of Daniel. But, you know, you start looking at what they're saying, they're going, yes, this is a real possibility. Um, and so that's one of the ways that I, I verify, you know, am I looking at confirmation bias, seeing what I want to see? No, a lot of times I'm pulling from people who would never agree with me in my prophetic assessment, but, but they do see, you know, the trouble that we're facing and they there's the troubles they're describing are the things that we would expect from the four horsemen so i see a world right now that is very possibly in the first 
half of the seven years. Would you hold to a view uh, like the mid the midpoint type of a view where we should expect to see an antichrist figure um, popping his head up somehow politically, et cetera? And some people will look at that as well as uh, the abomination of desolation kind of being a, a beacon, if you will, to signal yep. uh, the midpoint. You would be kind of of that type of persuasion as well? I, I would. So um, I think everything starts with in the middle of the week, um, you know, he will halt the sacrifice and the grain offering and will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Um, so in... And the, one of the scary things about saying, hey, this is it, is it's real going to be real easy to test the, the thing that I'm this, you know, that I'm putting together here that's saying that this is the final week. Um, because we're, you know, I'm not really sure where did this whole thing kick off, right? Did it really kick off in January or did it kick off in September um, of 2020 with the Abraham Accords? that happened somewhere in there is the beginning of this week. Certainly the, the virus happened before that. Um, but somewhere in there is, is your sort of your beginning. So then you, you wonder where's the middle. Um, and the, the middle is a little, you know, kind of mysterious still, but it could be at the second half of 2023 or the spring of 2024, somewhere in there, there has to be an abomination of desolation and, and the sacrifice somehow has to restart so it can be halted. Um, and that's close. That's a really, you know, this is not like a far off someday. These are things that, that I'm saying, you know, if this is really the window, yeah, all these things are going to happen. And we should be watching very closely because they may not happen exactly the way people think. Like, for example, how many people saw the Abraham Accords and said, hey, that could be the Daniel Peace Agreement? A few. But most people just saw it as another iteration on, you know, the attempts for peace in the Middle East. Not a lot of people said, wait a sec, Abraham Accords is a confirmation of the, of the covenant. And many nations, four nations so far, more nations likely to come, have signed. There we go. That's, that's evidence that that we were told to watch for that indicates that this is the final week. Um, and so if, if not everybody recognized Abraham Accords, could, could they somehow, could there be an abomination of desolation that somehow missed also, because it just looks like some other natural event. And I think we can be sure that all these events until, you know, fire and brimstone start raining down from heaven and giant mountains are burning, you know, burning mountains fall into the sea, the things of the trumpet locusts come out of the, you know, th there's a time coming that it's going to be impossible to miss. But these early birth pains, and, and I really would tie the birth pains of Matthew 24 to the seals. So to me, we are in the birth pains right now. And a lot of people would agree that we're in the birth pains, but not necessarily agree that those are the seals, because this looks like birth pains for sure. Um, but they might, you know, think that it's still going to get worse later. Um, and, and I agree, it will get worse later. But I'm trying to send this warning out. Um, you know, in time for people to, to be watching and, and keep, you know, and do something to get ready, right? We, I mean, we all have to pray and ask the Lord what he wants us to do. Um, and we don't want to live in a spirit of fear, but we want to be wise and we want to be prepared and we want to, you know, ask the Lord what we can do um, if this really is that time and to give us wisdom for, for recognizing the things. If his word's being fulfilled in front of us, we want to see it. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to give people enough warning um, and enough of the scriptures that we're told to watch for that, that if this can, trend continues, that they can start then going, oh, yep, there we go. There's another confirmation. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, the, the, I, definitely the season has changed in the world. I think we can all identify that something is happening. So we might as well look for the signs because who knows, it could be any day. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And a watch therefore, right? So when, when yep. are we not supposed to be watching? Correct. All, all the time. Yep. Yep. And I agree with you. I agree that Jesus in Matthew 24 aligns the abomination of desolation as being the sign 
in which we are to watch for and what we are to look for, because it is going to help us understand the season that we're in. When you see all of this coming together and that, then, you know, we're, we're good to go. So that's definitely uh-huh. something I'm looking for. Some people may say, well, how could that even happen? Um, just from a, you know, just from a knowledge standpoint, the temple Institute in Jerusalem has everything it needs to start the, the temple sacrificial system today, if yep. they were allowed to do it. So from a technical standpoint, all they would need to erect is some kind of a temple uh, or portable sanctuary of a sort, and they have everything they need to, to do the sacrificing. So who knows if that'll happen? I guess we can wait and see. Talk to us a little bit about mm-hmm. the uh, the Jubilee cycle, because that's also a part of, of this whole thing. Yeah, so that, that was something that really blew me away. Um, and I didn't really find that until um, I felt the Lord was telling me to go write the book. Um, and so there were things that, like I said, that as, um, as, as you go through, I, I'm like, this is really compelling, but what else? And um, the Jubilees, the year of Jubilee is a beautiful picture of, or seems to be a beautiful prophetic picture of the return of the Lord and the start of the, the millennium. Um, and, and why? Because it, it says that, you know, the, you'll set the captives free and, and that kind of thing. Um, but, but it's always been said and taught that I've seen that we don't know when the Jubilee years were. And that there is no jubilee cycle that we can positively identify. Um, but as I was doing some research, I came across, uh, wait a sec, no, no, there's there's some jubilees in scripture, and and we can fix the date. And I'm like, what? Um, and the first one that the rabbis talk about, um, and actually there's two that the rabbis talk about. I don't agree with both of them. I really only agree with one. One is a is a really kind of an inference. But one is straight from scripture, and it's in uh, Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1, and it's one of these passages that says, you know, it was 25 years after the exile, um, 14 years, you know, after the um, destruction, in the beginning of the year, on the 10th of the month, um, you know, the word of the Lord came, and da-da-da, and you go like, okay, I mean, all of scripture is inspired, all those details, um, you know, give something that, that was important for, for us to know as a church, but not necessarily at, at all times. Um, and not meaning all times throughout, throughout history, but just in, in each of our lives, there's things that, you know, I don't understand the meaning of that. And so, you know, I just, I read it and, and I move on. It shows me the historicity and, and the reality, but I don't know what it really teaches. Um, but the rabbis did, they go, this says, in the beginning of the year on the 10th of the month, the beginning of the year, which is Rosh Hashanah is the first of Tishri, not the 10th. So, but there's one time every 50 years that Rosh Hashanah is on Yom Kippur, the 10th of the month of Tishri. And that's on the year of Jubilee. And it's because in Leviticus, it, God just said, Hey, you know, on the 10th of the month, I want you to consecrate the year of Jubilee and sound the trumpets and declare the, you know, the Rosh Hashanah. And you're like, Whoa, wait a sec. Why did God say every 50 years you declare Rosh Hashanah on the 10th, not on the first weird. That just like, that blew my mind. And and there's your, um, anybody listening, who's familiar with the feasts of the Lord and the seven feasts and their potential prophetic significance should be blown away by the fact that, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah are the same day every 50 years in the year of Jubilee. That's, you know, it's not an accident. God doesn't just randomly decide to celebrate it on the 10th. Um, but what, what that means is by saying it was in the 25th year of the exile, the 14th year after the destruction of Jerusalem, that that year was a first of the beginning of the year was on the 10th. That means that year was a Jubilee. We know when the temple was destroyed. So we know that 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 574 bc basically was a year of jubilee and that's not a it's not a crazy inference it's not a it's it's a really solid yes the only year that you have beginning of the year on the 10th of the month is a jubilee year it tells us that the timing to the destruction we know when the destruction was 574 was the jubilee year wow 
all right, that's awesome. I didn't know that there were any Jubilee years revealed in scripture, except I had heard about one in the New Testament, but I hadn't thought about it. Um, and that is uh, the year 27 AD when Christ began his ministry. And, and the reason why it's not really taught as, as definitive in 27 AD is because we didn't know um, for sure when, uh, when, when Christ began his ministry, because people have debated whether it was 27 AD, 28 or 29 AD. And so because there was this sort of debate, it made it hard um, to, to def be definitive on what year that was. But it was the year Jesus began his ministry. He had just been baptized by John. He goes out in the wilderness for 40 days. Um, and then he comes back in and he goes into the synagogue, I think in Capernaum, and he opens the scroll of Isaiah and he reads from chapter, I think, 61. But he says, you know, um, for it has been given me to, you know, to declare freedom to the captives uh, and, you know, restore sight to the blind. And, you know, some things along that, that really are basically a quote. Isaiah is quoting the year of Jubilee. And he says then at the end of that, he rolls it up and he says, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. So then people have gone, well, if he's reading from Isaiah, who's quoting from the year of Jubilee, and he says, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing, that must have been a year of Jubilee. And then that would mean that 27 AD was a, a, a Jubilee year too. And I went, huh, 27 AD, does that line up with this other independent date from Ezekiel in 574 BC? And guess what? They're on the same 50 year cycle. So 50, 574 goes to 524, 524, you can count by 50s up to 24 um, BC and you 24 BC to cross the date line and you lose a year. So it's 23, 23 plus 27 is 50. So that's exactly 50 years. Um, there's also a debate though. People say, well, time out. Um, the, Jubilee, the Jubilee count is 49 years, not 50. And, um, and I really think that's, that's mistaken. And I go through an extensive proof because whenever I want to lean on an argument, it was 50 years on an account. How do you know it was 50? Um, especially when it's debated and I lay out, it, no, it's 50. The scriptures declare it was 50 years. Um, and there's, you know, Jewish tradition. There's all kinds of really good reasons to, to defend the, it was 50 years means 50, um, but I, I won't take the time to, to go through that there. It's, uh, but it's, it, I think it's very, very defensible to say 50 years is 50. And um, so that gives you 27 AD, right? Perfect. You go, wow, that's like a 2% chance of happening by accident. That's, that's kind of interesting. But then you go to the stone decree in, in Jerusalem today, right? And you go 1537 plus 490 years, that's 2027. 2027 is also on the same 50 year cycle. So that's three independent events all in the same 50 year cycle. That's like, that's like going, um, let, let's say someone spun a roulette wheel and they had red seven and then you go, all right, well, I'm going to get red seven again, spin it. And they're like, no way, never happened. Can't, can't do it. Right. You spin it and you get red seven. And then they go, all right, now I'm going to get red seven again, spin it again. Like, no way, never happened. So it's a one in 2,500 chance to have three independent events all in the same 50-year cycle. One in 2,500 is like a 99.96% chance that's not just a coincidence. To me, that starts to add up to evidence. Um, and so, and then there's, there's several other things that also fall in that same 2027 window. So that, to me, it's, this is so far beyond coincidence that I, I'm confident this is as unlikely as it feels um, I, th I think we're, we're there, but, um, but yeah, taking those, those events, if that's, if that's all correct, then at end of 2027 would be the final Jubilee. Um, it would be, and not only would it be a final Jubilee, um, but it would also mark 6,000 years of world history. And you probably saw that also as, an, as one of the arguments. Um, and we, we could, we could get to that, but I, I just, an amazing convergence of, of testimonies in scripture. Yeah, I agree. It's phenomenal. You did a great job. <laughs> now what, what's next? Um, well, 
yeah, if, if these are the days, then, then, you know, there's a lot of work for us to do um, sharing and warning people. And so, you know, that's a big part of the book. Um, and, but there's also a part of just trusting the Lord where he has us, right. And being faithful when for the, those 10 virgins, um, they all fell asleep, but at midnight, the cry came out that the bridegroom was coming. And so they all got up and they started trimming their wicks and you go, so what's trimming, trimming our wicks is, is getting, you know, it's, it's purifying ourselves. It's, it's getting our hearts and minds ready um, to meet the Lord. But as they tried to do that, there were five of the virgins who found that they didn't have enough oil. And to me, oil represents, it can represent the Holy Spirit. Um, but in a sense, it also represents faith, right? And, and how do we get the Holy Spirit is by faith. Um, but but the, we, we, the reason why we know it's something like that is because the, the parable says that, that the other virgins who were unwise or were foolish asked the wise ones to share their oil with them. And they said, no, we can't do that, right? You have to go buy it for yourself. And so they went out to the market to go try to buy oil. Well, just like I can't give you my faith, right? I can't give my faith to my children. I can lead them in the way that they, they need to go. I can train them up and teach them. But in the end, they have to go get it for themselves. And I think, you know, we're in this time where um, if, if you've neglected prophecy, if, if your heart is far from the Lord, there's going to come a place where um, the, the lies of the world are going to seem a lot stronger than the truths of Scripture. And they're going to be more believable. And, and people are not, they're going to be, you know, it says that the deception that's coming in the last days will be so good that it would deceive even the elect if that were possible. And how do we, how do we avoid that? Well, because then we need to know, we need to heed the warnings of scripture. We need to watch like Jesus told us to watch. If we're not watching, it's, it's said that, you know, the, the day would surprise us like a thief, like a thief in the night. Um, but in second Thessalonians, Paul tells us, yeah, but you are not of the night that that day would overtake you like a thief. You're all children of the day. And that means if we're children of the day, we're watching. We know the scriptures. We're prepared. Um, we believe the testimony of scripture, right? We have faith. And, and when, when God fulfills his word right in front of us, we don't go, ah, but that's probably a coincidence. We go, look, God's fulfilling his word. Um, some people today would say that the return of Israel as a nation is just a big coincidence that, you know, was never intended by God, that that's just some kind of accident. Um, and I go, no, God clearly says in his word over and over that he'd bring his people back into the land. It even says, um, oh, shoot, now I've forgotten the reference. Um, but, he, but there's a, a reference in, it's in the book. Um, but I will bring them back a second time, you know, and restore them. And you're like, the second time? When's that? Like, that's now this is the second time that Israel has been restored. I mean, it's just, you know, that that's not an accident. We, when we see that God's word is fulfilled, we've got to call it out and say, look, there's a fulfillment. God's keeping his word. And if we're in a day when lots of prophecies are being fulfilled, prophecies that are from 2,500 years ago, 2,700 years ago, I think that that's different, right? This, this is not a time like any other time. Um, it has taken a long time to develop in our years, right? So um, I was born in 1973. So that was the Yom Kippur War. Israel was already an established nation. I mean, Israel has been a reality in my entire life. But historically, this is, you know, no other generation has been in that time like we are. So it's, it, there's a really amazing things. And I think if, if they're recognized, it strengthens our faith. It, it puts us to read the scriptures more right? It, it encourages us to pray more. It encourages us to, to really get ready for the bridegroom. Um, and, uh, I, and, and be in a spirit of joy rather than a spirit of fear for, for what we're facing right now in the world, which is really, I mean, without recognizing the times we're in, this is a, this is a big storm that we're in as a, as a world and as a nation. Um, and it's, I, I don't see any time except for, you know, massive world wars of the past that people could have really had such a dark outlook on the horizon. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think 
the uh, <clears throat> there's so much illusion, especially in the, in the the high up social circles, if you will. There's the these themes that you pick up on. You know, they're they're talking about needing to reduce our footprint. They're talking about you know climate change, the environment um, being <clears throat> being assaulted, if you will. And I know some some people are climate deniers, whatever. That's besides the point. But we read in prophecy that things are going to dry up. You know, the Nile, the Euphrates. There's going to be massive mm-hmm. famines. There's going to be, if you will, pandemics. There's going to be tri- uh, troubles. There's going to be tribulations. There's going to be all kinds of stuff. Jesus in Matthew 24 says false messiahs, plural, you know, messianic yep. type figures arising, of course, an ultimate anti-messiah. Um, but ultimately people, Hey, follow me. I will, I will lead you. You know, these, this type of messaging will increase in the last days. And um, this is stuff to watch for. Jesus all you know, says these are just part of the science. And when you see this stuff coming it, to fruition, to lift your heads. Redemption's coming. Yeah. Yes, there's a storm, but this storm, if if we're in the last days, we literally could be looking at, um, I mean, if, if we're in the cycle, I should say, we really could be looking, let's say 2027 is the time, which nobody knows, right? We'll see when we get there. Right. But if that's the case, 2028 is year one of the millennium. Yeah, that's right. That's, yeah, and it's really not the end of the world. That's the way Jesus wants yeah. us to look at it. It's not like the world is ending in 2027. That's a problem with a lot of prophecy is there's so much doom and gloom. People don't know to look beyond and to see what is coming. What's beyond right. the trouble that the Bible predicts? Eternal life, resurrection, restoration, uh, earth coming back to life, uh, a total you know, reordering of the ecosystems and everything else in the world. So even though we'll enter a season of trial, tribulation, or trouble, we come out the other side, purified, refined, redeemed, restored, and resurrected. So, yeah. Amen. And, and it's very much like, you know, the, the, the dark times that we're in um, are like being in a tunnel. And if if what I'm seeing in scripture and events is correct and, and is lining up for, for 2027 to really be the conclusion, this is the final seven years. To me, that's like seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So we're not out. We, in fact, it might get a lot rougher as we still go forward, but I can see the end to that rescue. And somehow for me, knowing the end and is in sight for our rescue, it can even get a lot worse. And I'm still going to be hopeful, right? Without that, maybe I would despair more. Um, as you know, times I, you can think about, you know, times that people, um, could have suffered in, in the past and it just would have been, it would have been hard. I, I, I think of Richard Warmbrand, um, in, in prison and people know his story. He's founded a voice of the martyrs. Um, but he was years just beaten every day and miraculously came out of that. Um, you know, healed in his mind um, and, and very much in his body um, so that he could still, he was, he still had pain. Um, but, but there was a hope that he had just carried him through that just, you know, God's with him. And, and that, that really should be enough and carry us through all the time. But, but the days that I think are coming are going to be so terrible um, that we're really going to until our rescue when, when that comes um, uh, it, it's going to help to, to sort of be reading along in the biblical narrative and realize where we are and to go, Oh, Hey, all right. This is, this is all terrible, but it's following his plan. He's in control. Okay. I can trust him. Um, and, and I hope that that's what knowing where we are does for people that it really helps them to trust that God has got all of this under control, fully planned. And even though some of us, um, I mean, believers right now in the world are already facing terrible things. And if Christians in Afghanistan, as soon as we decided, you know, that we were pulling out of there, I mean, it was a death sentence for so many believers in Afghanistan. And yet, you know, can they trust God too through that? Yes. Yes, they can. But, um, but that doesn't mean it's easy. So. No, Absolutely. Well, do you have any final thoughts on that? And then I also want you to, again, show the, the picture of the book and then also references to websites, et cetera. Oh, yeah, sure. 
Um, yeah, no, I think if, if people get the book actually, um, so, uh, you can get a free copy of the PDF of the book. Um, if you go to my website and um, and look for my newsletter, sign up for the newsletter, you can download a free PDF copy. Um, the, the paperbacks are available on Amazon. They're $25. Um, so for anybody who, who that's an obstacle, you can also get a Kindle version for nine ninety seven. Um, so anywhere in there, there's, there's a, an option. I want everybody who's, who's willing to put in the time to read it because it's 400 pages. So it's not a, you know, it's not a quick read. There's a lot of information there. Um, but I've really worked hard to make it accessible for everybody. Um, if, you know, if you want, if you are somebody who really needs to know all the facts on a particular point, because that doesn't seem to line up with what you were taught, um, then that evidence is in there. If, you know, you read that and you go, oh, yep, then like a lot of things are in footnotes. So I, you know, if it gets really technical, I put it in a footnote so that I didn't want to bog people down. Um, but, but if you think that if you're seeing it's light on technical information, then don't forget to read the footnotes, right? Because I, I did put all those in there. I'm just trying to make it uh, in a way that, that reaches everybody, um, you know, so that people can get the level of detail that they need to, to be able to move on to the next point. Um, but you can find those at, at endtimesbrain.com. You can also go to witnessingtheend.com and you can find uh, a web page for the book itself. Um, and you can find again that on, on Amazon. And I also, uh, there's a way to contact me to send questions. So, you know, if, if something still doesn't seem resolved for people, I encourage them to, to reach out, send me an email, ask that question that goes, but wait a sec, what about this? Um, you know, I, I try to address all those kinds of things for people because um, I don't want, you know, one small question that, that to hang somebody up. If I can give them a more detailed answer that, you know, I just didn't explain um, enough in the book, uh, you know, to resolve that for them. And I've tried to be real thorough, but there is a place where, you know, you've got to call it good enough um, on any, you know, given point. But but I'll engage with people on a, on a one-to-one -one basis. If that's, you know, again, if that wasn't enough, so. Very good. Well, we appreciate your time. Yeah. Uh, excellent resource. Uh, people definitely, definitely get your copy or a PDF or however you want to do it, but I would recommend reading it. it does a great job of covering a lot of the themes in the Bible uh, or in prophecy, I should say, and uh, just addressing them, not necessarily exhaustively, but, but definitely bringing it up to where people could understand some of these patterns. I remember when I started studying some of this stuff, you know, it just seemed overwhelming. You hear people talk about, you know, the, the 70 weeks or the 60, 60, uh, what is the 62 weeks? And then there's, you know, 69 weeks. And then there's the um, four beasts and, you know, four kingdoms and yeah, 10, 10 horns and, and 10 yeah. horns and little horn and, you start, you know, this is a lot of imagery to, to digest. And for a lot of people, they steer away from it because they don't trust the source. They don't trust what's being said necessarily, or it's just too confusing. I think this book does an excellent job of explaining um, what you're proposing, what you think is happening. And for that reason, I think it's definitely worth people's time to read it, engage with it and understand it. So again, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, God bless you for all your effort and your hard work. Thank you, Matthew. I appreciate that.